Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him. And I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord Christ.
maybe to create a more creative spirit in our approach to life. Yes, we're adults, and we're most of us pretty smart and pretty sophisticated, aren't we? We have at our disposal all the wonderful fruits of the Enlightenment, not to mention the wonderful modern science and technological tools like our iPhone apps and internet and video streaming. So all these things help us to continue to analyze and to divide the world into those same rigid categories. Alive or not alive? True or not true? Possible or not possible? Reality or myth? Believing, doubting. But what do we do with Easter? Its claims are not scientific or rational. It defies our expectations. The dead Jesus has been raised, crossing over to life from the tomb, reversing the natural processes and boundaries. He was not where the women expected to find him. So which category do we put him in? Alive or not alive? True or not true? Possible or not possible? Believing or doubting? You know, in my many years in the ministry, I've heard many attempts at rationalizing the story of the resurrection. I've heard preachers and lay people alike go through amazing contortions to demystify the story and to force it into the neat categories of human science. One says Jesus wasn't really dead, he was only in a coma. And those poor ancient people didn't really understand medical science very well, the way we do today. Another states that Jesus' message was so powerful that it seemed as though he were still alive and still present among the disciples, inspiring them to go on and found the church in his memory. Another points to the annual miracle of spring, the tender shoots of new life that sprout from dead leaves and the stumps of winter. And another marvels at a new baby with her perfect little fingers and toes. Well, I'm sorry, but I have to tell you what I think about all of that. Poppycock! Bah! Humbug! Of course, yes, spring is wonderful and it lifts our spirits. And who doesn't marvel at the fingers and toes of a newborn baby? These things are wonderful and speak of the marvel of God's creation. But these things are not what the resurrection of Jesus is about. These are not miracles. They are part of the natural processes of life. Wonderful as they are, they are a predictable part of God's creation. And they fit neatly into those categories we have memorized so well. They will not transform us. They will not save us. Jesus' resurrection does not fit into any of these tidy categories. And thanks be to God that it does not. The good news of the gospel is that the power of God transcends these categories, these scientific organizing principles, these human means by which we attempt to quantify the mysteries of life. Our God acts. The power of divine love has lifted Jesus from the tomb and catapulted him back into life again. It was God whose great I Am spawned the earth and all its categories of created things, both living and not living. It was the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, returning him to life. And this same God promises to act again for us, to raise us from the little depths within our own lives, conquering the category of death by raising us daily and forever to newness of life, just as he did with Christ. It is a huge, mystifying proclamation, this good news of Easter. Do we have the courage to believe in it, to believe it in this modern, sophisticated age? Do we have the humility to acknowledge that there is still some deep mystery at the heart of human death and life? Do we have the faith to dance forward to the music, even when we aren't sure of the rhythm or
or where the steps will lead us. The author, Annie Dillard, reflected on this question when she visited a church service on an East Sunday, Easter Sunday long ago, and she wrote these words. It is madness to be wearing spring dresses and straw hats, Sunday suits and polished shoes. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews. Yes, there is tremendous power in what we proclaim here this morning. The dead Christ is risen, raised by the power of God. And this risen, living Lord is here among us, calling to us, dancing with us, drawing us out of the neat categories by which we've orchestrated our lives to a place of new and deeper and more abundant life. If we can believe this, if we can open ourselves to this power, all the dead parts of ourselves will be brought back to life. We will ourselves rise from death to life, utterly transformed. Of course, this miracle of new life does not always burst upon us as it does on an Easter Sunday. There may not always be organ and orchestra and full choir singing the Schubert Mass. There may not always be lilies and azaleas around the altar. There may be no altar at all. Just as often, new life is born in the silent darkness that feels like a tomb. It may begin its quiet germination in the midst of grief, or loneliness, or desperation. That is, in fact, how it happened that first Easter, when the women came to the tomb in the dark of the early morning. They expected death, and at first there was no clear sign that they would find anything else. In John's version of the story, Mary assumes they have taken the body away and stands by the tomb weeping. In her grief, she could not yet imagine anything but the sting of death in that darkness. In Luke's version, there are two men in bright apparel who say to the women, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why, indeed, the transformation had already taken place. In the darkness of the tomb, while the women were weeping, in the long watches of the night, life grew again like a seed sprouting in the dark soil. Today, 2,000 years later, we breathe in again the fragrance of that blossom. Then and now it explodes the rigid boundaries of our human categories. It invites us into mystery and wonder. It germinates the seeds of transformation in the darkest times of life, and then bursts forth with such beauty, we wonder that we did not recognize it all along. Yesterday, in the quiet of Holy Saturday, between the dark of Good Friday and the brightness of this Easter morning, I received a message from a former student from Swapkin. She'd been a member of our campus ministry, and now she's away for a year on a Fulbright in a small village in a non-Christian country, studying sea turtles. A brilliant scientist, she has struggled many times with her Christian faith. I believe she would be humbled but happy to know that I share part of her message with you on this joyful Easter morning. This is what she wrote. It is almost Easter here, though it does not 